Hey everybody, it's Michael Herbridge and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm, I'm a couple minutes early. I was going with the mouse across and all of a sudden it showed a countdown that we were going live. I accidentally hit the button. So uh, we'll give everybody a couple minutes to get in here while we're waiting for people to get in. I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do tonight and then I'll show you what we did last week, the, the finished results if you didn't see the picture. So tonight I'm gonna show you guys how to build this witch's hat. I did cut it out with um, stars in it that it could be a luminary. Um, I'm gonna show you how to make the leaves, the berries, the acorns, the little pumpkins and everything on here. We'll talk about the finish on here as well. Um, but I also wanted to show you guys, if you didn't see the bowl that we did. So last week I did combining ceramics and glass and this is the finished piece. And if you remember, this was done with black matte glaze on the inside and outside and then on that while that coat of glass or glaze was wet on the inside we took and added glass frit pieces of glass and pebbles in the bottom and that's how that piece turned out and if you were there last week um, remember me talking about the adventuring glass you can see that glass kind of sparkly in there and that is the adventuring glass and it's it's dripping down on the sides here too you can see that glittery sparkle in that glass. So this piece hasn't been sealed yet. I'm gonna put a sealer over it because the glass can get some little sharp edges on it. I usually let it sit for a day or two after I fire it before I seal it um, because you will hear some crackling and crazing on that piece um, as it uh, cools and, and just sits because that glass gets the fractures in it. And I talked about all that in the last one. So tonight, again, I'm going to show you guys, for those of you just tuning in now, it's um, almost six o'clock here. Um, this is what we're we'll working on tonight. I'm going to show you guys how to build this clay witch's hat. Um, I'm going to do a little bit smaller version of this one. I did this one on the medium wide cone. Um, it's a, a pretty big size. There are narrower, taller ones. There are wide, really tall ones to make things like that poinsettia tree. Tonight, I'm gonna work on the small wide cone. And this one is, I'm gonna say about 12, 13 inches. I think this one is, is 12. So this one is about 13 inches high. It does go all the way down to this little small, um, narrow one. This one I thought would be cool to make that witch's hat and use it on a pumpkin as a hat on a pumpkin so eventually i'll get that done also just wanted to show you this piece i never did get painted but using the cones also to make this was a, a workshop that i did there's a video out there on this making a gnome home um, and i have a little gnome that goes on here a little dog using that cone basically doing almost the same technique that we're going to be doing tonight so I'm going to flip the camera down here. And um, I've got my cone. And if you're not familiar with the clay puzzling uh, forms, a lot of them are two piece. The cones are a one piece. We work on the outside of the cone. You can work right on it with the clay. I do like to wrap it with paper because it makes it easier to slide it off of the cone. And it also adds some strength on the inside of the cone um, with that paper because the paper stays inside. So I'm just taking a piece of newspaper, I'm gonna wrap it around, and then I'm gonna tuck the extra paper on the inside of the cone. Sometimes if I don't have big enough pieces of newspaper, I have to put a piece of masking tape on there. Um, but this one, it works fine with that large piece of paper. Um, I've already got some clay rolled out into slabs here. You can do this using a slab roller. You can use it using a rolling pin, um, but you basically want to wrap this cone with clay. And this clay is rolled to a half inch thickness. You can work with, um, I'm working with a Raku clay body. I was thinking I might raccoon part of this um, and then do some dry brushing on this next one. Um, you can work with a, a stoneware clay body. You can work with a low fire clay body. <clears throat> Any type of clay will work with this technique. The finish that I have on the one that I just showed you, that is a non-fired finish using an acrylic black base coat and then what's called dry brushing using the metallic creams and then we added a little bit of foil and I'll talk about that later in the live. The cones do have 
a base on them that sticks out. We put this base purposely on those cones after I did a workshop and people forgot to pull the cone out until it was almost too late in the class. So this, this base is on here. I usually don't go over that base, but um, tonight we might go over that base. I'll show you a couple different things with that. That base was on there so that I could see in workshops if I saw that bisque base sticking out on a piece, I knew that people hadn't pulled their piece out of the cone. Before that, when we didn't have that base sticking out, people would clay puzzle right down to their work surface, and I couldn't see if the cone was in there or not. So that's why that base is, is on there. So I'm going to take my slab of clay, and I'm going to wrap it around my cone. It's going to stick up a little bit above the top of this so that the top of the cone has um, extra clay on that. And I'm just going to take a needle tool, and anywhere then that this slab of clay starts to overlap, I'm just going to take and cut this away. I'm going to let it overlap a little bit. Wrap this around. In this way, I'm covering most of the cone with this slab, and then I can take and fill in these open areas with this piece. And I can take one of the other slabs that I have here and fill in this area. I'm just going to tear off, press it in. Then I will cut away this extra on the bottom. Now I can leave. So a lot of times when we're doing cones and we're doing pieces that just go down to that area, I will cut it away. And there's two ways that you can do this. You can either leave extra clay on there to make the, the rim of your hat, or you can cut it away, and then we're going to add a thick coil around this edge, and we're going to pinch it out. So I'm going to do half of this with the clay sticking out, and then the other part of it I'm going to do with the coil, or I'll do a little section with that coil. Don't need quite this much on here, so I'm going to cut a little bit of that away. Got one more slab here that I can tear off. If you guys have any questions tonight, feel free to type them in. My wife Janine is here. She's watching for the questions to come up, and she'll get my attention. Everybody's um, complaining about how hot it is where they are. Uh, yeah, that's... They're competing with where it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw on the news today they were talking about, I think, the U.S. or the world broke a record today for the average temperature being like the hottest or something, and, and they were just talking about how about warm it is. Warming. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about global warming. They were just saying how, like, we've broken a record, and they said that's not a record to be proud of, and <laughs> and they talked about all the things that could contribute to it and what we can do to prevent that from happening. What I'm doing now is everywhere that those pieces of clay overlapped, I'm just taking my finger and I'm smoothing this out. You can also do that with a wooden tool or I do like these flexible ribs because I can take those and they will bend to kind of fit the contour of the piece. And I'm going to drag that up now that I've got those pieces squished together and that will compress all of those areas where those slabs overlapped. If I've got a heavy, thick piece of clay on there, as I drag that over, I will either spread that lump of clay out or I will actually pull it off using this rib. And I'm just going to work my way all the way around the cone and compress. If there's an area that's low, I can take some of that clay off of that tool or off of that rib, kind of squish it into that area. If I had done one big slab and wrapped it around here, I wouldn't have a lot of smoothing to do. But a lot of times in workshops, I don't take a slab roller along. Um, and so I show people how to take pieces of clay, put it over their cone, and then how to <laughs> smooth it. And we're not looking for a perfectly smooth surface on here. Um, oh. Someone wants to ask or wants to know if we'll be seeing more videos from you after the shows are finished, but you pretty much have on and off continuous stuff all. Yeah. All, you know, 
Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah as far as I, I will be on when I can, and um, right now is I'm I'm pretty well caught up with stuff and. July, um, home. July I'm home. August, August I'm gone a lot. Yeah. So August there probably won't be lives on Thursday nights. Um, they may be a different night if we do have something. And then Lisa wants to know about your fancy bracelet. Yes, my fancy bracelet. That. Isn't that beautiful? So Iola has what's called the car show right now. And, and if you're not familiar with the town that we live in, it's a town of, I don't know, 1300 and something. And um, we have every year a car show the second weekend of July and we get hundreds of thousands of people come to our town. There used to be a publishing company in town that published old car magazines and they started the show a long time ago. And if you live here, you either volunteer and help, which is why I have a, a bracelet. I was working at a shake stand today, um, filling machines with ice cream while well, other people made the shakes and the ice cream cones and uh, bowls of ice cream. Um, and so that's the bracelet is for the car show. It goes on mm -hmm. this whole weekend. And, and he'll be working there again, so he has to have it. Yeah, I have to work again on Saturday. And Saturday night then at the campground. There's a campground that people camp at too. Mm -hmm. And it's all volunteer. It's cool for our town because um, all of, if you do volunteer, um, the car show does pay and then the money goes to whatever organization you want the money to go to. So it's a good fundraiser for a lot of organizations around the area. All right, so I've got the cone pretty well smoothed out. My bottom here obviously isn't exactly how I want it. So I'm just gonna take a wooden tool and I'm going to cut the rim of my hat on this area. Now where I didn't leave, a rim on the hat, I can take and make a coil of clay. So you would do either or. I'm just showing you guys both ways that this could be done. Um, you can take and add a big coil of clay. I'm going to squish this together here. And I'm going to add this coil in that area. And I'm going to take and I'm going to mash it into the top for the top side of this, I'm going to mash into the cone. I'm going to squish that in. And then the bottom, I could just take and pinch that big coil out to make the rim of my hat. So you can do this either, either way. I'm going to mash this down now so that it matches up with my level that I left on there. I kind of like leaving the extra clay on there. I think it's a little bit easier than adding the coil. Yeah, just a little bit around here. Didn't make that coil quite thick enough to have the rim of my hat going out the same distance here. Our little town doesn't have, we don't even have a stoplight in our town and they have to have police directing traffic at some of the main intersections with the number of vehicles that are coming and going. For those of you who've been here for retreat, you may not have seen the car show grounds right on the edge of town. Um, it's a huge, God, I don't know how many acres it is. It goes out. They have so many old cars here and so many people, and they have a swap area with a lot of junk that I think I look at and go, oh my gosh, but it's like bumpers and car parts and headlights. And today I walked by a booth on my way to work and there was a booth that had all kinds of horns in their, their booth dating back to very, very old, old cars that had horns. I think you probably had to reach out the window and squeeze like you had on a bike. Um, the 
does the clay have to be one inch all the way around? Uh, one inch all the way around. So a hat, I did a, the, the slab was a half an inch thick. And so that, yeah, it was a half an inch thick. And the rim of your hat, you can make it go out as far as you want. Once I've got um, this done, I'm going to take the cone out. But I want to mention on the top of this, I did leave a little bit of extra clay up at the top so that I could bend this and get my curve. But I'm not going to get that bend until I take it out of the cone. So I'll pull that excess paper out, and then I kind of wedge my hand and stick it inside the cone, and I kind of twist it like this once I have it wedged in there. And I can pull that cone out, set that aside, and then that extra paper I tuck up on the inside. Now on the bottom of this, because I, oops, I put a lot of pieces together, I can go over and I can kind of smooth these out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this, but normally I would go and smooth out those areas where those pieces of clay met up to make sure that they're attached well. Set this down on my surface. Now I can take the rim of the hat and I can kind of pinch this and flatten it out on the edge. And then I can add a little bit of a kind of ruffle. And as I pinch this out, you can see it kind of gets a natural ruffle. I want this hat to look a little worn on the edge. You can have it perfectly smooth if you like. I'm just going to pinch all the way around. And then I'm going to take and kind of lift up in some areas and leave it lower in some areas. And then the top of the hat, to get my, my bend on the top of the hat, you don't want to just take this and bend it because it'll probably just snap it off. So it's kind of, I'm squeezing it and pinching it and kind of stretching and then I start to work that tip over. If I start to feel like I'm ripping the clay off, then I just do it a little bit slower and I don't bend quite as much, but I can get as much of a bend or a twist in the top as I want. And I'm gonna go down a little bit further and you can see I'm using kind of my um, middle finger and my thumb to kind of grip this and pinch it and then kind of stretch it and bend it around. And I kind of like that little twist in the hat, so I'm gonna leave it like that. Then I can look at it and make sure that my hat is straight up and down. If I want it a little wonky, I can take and make little kind of indentations in the hat. I can kind of pinch it and squeeze it a little bit. Um, generally, a witch's hat, I want it to be a little bit wonky. So I've kind of pinched and indented a little bit so that it's not perfectly smooth, but I want it kind of standing upright. Then we're going to create a band that will go around the hat. I'm just going to flatten this out a little bit here. I've got a little bit of a bump sticking up here so that I can put that band around the hat. So I'm going to set that aside for a minute. I'm going to grab my clay here. Again, any type of clay body will work for this. And I'm going to use my handy dandy clay cutter, which most of you have seen that has the adjustable bar on it. We still have these in stock. And I'm going to make this um, probably close to a half an inch. And I'm going to cut off pieces of clay and I'm going to take it, I'm going to fold this over a couple times because I want to do one long narrow strip. Now I could do this with um, a clay extruder if I wanted. Um, I can roll this into a coil. And when you roll coils by hand, a lot of people put their hands like this and they roll like that and, and it turns their coil into what I call kind of a speed bump is it it just goes brrr as you as you roll and so if you feel like your hands are kind of vibrating as you go and your coil isn't round um, fan your fingers out like this and you'll see as I as I roll this and so here it's a little bit thinner here it's a little thicker I'm going to work this end a little bit and I'm kind of doing this motion as I do that 
and on this end it's a little bit thicker so I'm going to roll that out. Now this band doesn't have to be perfectly um, even. It, this again, it's a witch's hat. And what I'm going to do to measure to see if I've got it long enough is I'm going to take and I'm going to wrap it around. And I'm around a little more than halfway. So I need to roll this out a little bit longer. If I used the extruder, a hand extruder to do this, I would use like the big wide ribbon band to extrude out a nice flat coil of clay but not everybody has the hand extruder someone wants to know how much clay you go through in a month creating um it varies some months i create a lot and i go through i don't know 500 to a thousand pounds of clay probably and i'm not making stuff to to sell finished pieces that's just projects for workshops and, and different techniques and things and for the lives. Um, but there's always um, several attempts sometimes at some things before I get one that turns out. So sometimes it might uh, I might do three of these before I get one that I really like and show you guys. So my coil is more than the length that I need. So I'm going to pull that off. And I can take this and I can just flatten this out with my finger and I'm going to make this so it's probably about a half an inch thick again and then I can decide what type of texture I want to add to this. Um, this witch's hat has a brand new texture pad that's going to be coming out on this band and it's a uh, it's kind of a natural woven look, and we don't have those made yet. Um, I was working with a prototype when I did that sample, and today I realized, I'm like, oh, shoot, we don't have that, that one made. But we do have a new bark texture pad that I'm going to use tonight. So we've had the large bark texture pad, and we've had the small bark texture pad. And a lot of people asked when we first came out with them, they said, is the texture in the small one different than the big one and it's not this is part of this big texture pad it was taken from the same um, slab of clay we just made basically a section of this into the small one so a lot of people were asking they said could you do one with a finer bark texture so this is a brand new and look at how nice and deep that texture is this is called the mini bark because it has a smaller bark pattern on it than the original small one. So both of these will be available. We just put this one up on the website today. It's the mini texture pad. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to go along and I haven't even used this one yet. So this is the first time I'm using it. I'm going to press it into that coil to get a texture. And I'll just take and overlap this. I don't want to press too hard and go all the way through. I'll hold this up once I get the whole thing textured. And if there are areas where it's not quite deep enough, I can always take that and I can just press over those areas to add a little bit more bark texture. A couple spots here where I didn't press hard enough. So this is the texture of that bark in here. And when you do press that out, it stretches that coil a little bit more. So I probably have way more than I need. But I'm going to take it. I'm going to stand this up. I'm going to wrap it around. And I'm going to cut where it started. I'm going to cut this straight. And I'm going to run this end right up to it and then cut that off. Will you have the new bark texture pads for sale at Expo? I should, as long as we can make enough of them to 
keep them in stock. We should have those available at Expo. So now where that bark met up, the nice thing about that texture is I can take and squish this clay together here, and then I can just take that bark and I can repress it into that area. Nobody would know where that joint met up. I can also take and add some slip along the top of this and let it kind of run down to attach that. Um, otherwise, that piece could be loose on there. Um, so I would probably do some scoring on both sides and um, attach that as well. Um, if I don't do that, um, it could slide off after firing, and I'll just take some slip around there after the live and attach that. All of the leaves that I'm going to do on here, I did not attach those on my original one because it was a whole lot easier to paint this with all of the leaves separate, and then I glued them in place last night. About midnight last night, I think I got that one, one done. Now I'm going to make the buckle, and so I'm going to take this piece of clay, and I'm going to kind of figure out how big I need that buckle to be. I'm going to flatten out this clay to be about a half an inch thick, and I'm going to cut out a square, or you can make it a little bit more rectangle. So this is about the size that I want the buckle to be. And then I can take and cut out the inside of that. So I'm going to carefully take the needle tool, cut out the inside. And once I've got that cut out, the edges that are, are a little rough, so I'll just take my thumb and kind of work that and smooth out the sharp edges. I can take a wooden tool on the inside of this and smooth out <coughs> this interior area. And then I'll smooth the outside of that buckle as well. And then I'll figure out where I want that to go. And this too, I would probably score and slip. I'm just going to set it in place for now. And I'm going to kind of bend it over the top of that band. So it looks like that band is going inside. I'm going to flatten this out a little bit. And then I need to make the little, the little hook that latches. And so that's just a little piece of clay that I'm taking. And one end is a little bit thicker than the other. And that I would take and slip into place like that. So it looks like there's a little hook coming through and attaching. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make leaves. And so the leaves, and I won't make all of the leaves here, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with our rubber leaf forms, and we've got all different styles and sizes and different types of leaves. So on that larger hat, this is like the large of the Wisconsin maple, which is this leaf right here. Um, the oak leaves are really popular, the mum leaves, the dahlia leaves. And so I'll kind of look at the sizes of the leaves. Like this big oak leaf might be a little bit too much. The medium might still be a little bit too much, but the small one would be a good size. So I'll kind of go through and I'll pick out some leaves. So I've got some of the smaller leaves here. The real big ones I'm going to set aside. If I do a bigger size one, I would use those on there. And so... You said this would work with any clay before, but what clay? This is earthenware, right? This is... So this is a raku oh, clay body. Okay. Yep, this is a, a raku That's clay. I, she was listening yep. better than I was. And what I do like about the raku clay is it has sand in it, and it makes it a very stable clay. 
where a low fire white or real smooth stoneware clay that doesn't have sand or grog in it, um, the clay sometimes is a lot softer and you don't, it's not quite as stable because it doesn't have that sand in there to, to hold it up. And you just have to be a little bit more careful with a smooth clay body um, when you're working with it, that your hat is gonna be a little bit softer. Now, I, I took and I pressed this leaf into a little slab of clay. I tore away the excess clay, but then this extra clay that's on here, I just go around from the back side and kind of pull the clay up and pinch it off. Some people will take and put these on a surface and cut around the edge, but you get a real thick, clunky looking leaf. So many of you have seen my technique where I just take and I pinch the edge of this to kind of taper the leaf on the edges, but I leave it thick in the middle because if you go too thin with this clay over the leaf, when you go to peel it apart like this, the clay just wants to stick to the leaf and it doesn't come away, it'll rip and tear. So I've got my first leaf and I'm just gonna kind of take and position that where that leaf might set. And then I will do another leaf, I'll do a couple more leaves on here. Some of you can identify a lot more leaves than you ever could a year ago. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and some of them I'm still not sure how to pronounce. When we bought formal leaf, there's some strange leaves and I might be pronouncing it wrong, but somebody can correct me when I call it the sinceria leaf or I'm trying to think some of the other ones that are there. And I'm, I'm learning a lot more about different types of leaves that are out there. Now on this oak leaf, sometimes you have these real tight areas in here and it's hard to get your finger in there to rip the clay away. So I might take a tool like this and pull it up from the underside to cut that clay out of those real tight areas. I've tapered the edge and I peel my leaf away and I've got my oak leaf. So now I'll take that. And so I'm just doing some little twists and bends in here so the leaf isn't sitting perfectly flat. We'll do a few more leaves in here and then I'll show you guys how to do the berries. Do this as a small dahlia leaf. Tear away the excess. Pinch the edge down. Sometimes people spend so much time on these leaves and they say, oh, you always make it look so easy. And it really is. And I, I could probably do this in my sleep. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to have this leaf coming kind of in the other direction. And that's going to overlap that oak leaf a little bit. And so <laughs> I'll do one more leaf here. And then I'll show you how to do the, the berries. And we'll cut stars in here. This is actually a rose leaf, but it's kind of a nice, basic, standard-looking leaf. The lemon leaf is a nice one. The dogwood has really nice texture to it. These rose leaves, when we bought the company, they had, I, I just went yesterday to restock the bin that these rose leaves are in. We've sold hundreds of, of sets of these, and we still have probably... 500 sets of these leaves that were pre-made that we got with the company. Unfortunately, the really good sellers of the pain in the butt ones like the oak leaves and the maple leaves, there weren't any of those made ahead of time. All right, so I've got some leaves just sitting around. Again, I'm not gonna attach these at this point because if I do, it's a lot harder to paint. It's a lot easier to lift those leaves off and paint them separately, which is what I did on this leaf. And I did, I had one extra leaf last night that didn't fit on the piece. And so this is what the leaves look like. And it's really hard in photography to get that foil. I did a little bit of foil kind of on the edges of the leaves to add a little bit of sparkle. Um, so all of the leaves have, there's copper, there's green and, and gold I did on the, on the leaves. Now to make berries, there's different types of berries. So if I wanna make something like a blackberry or a raspberry, I use this fabric, and I think this is called tulle, we decided, right? It's a, a fabric you get at the fabric store, and it's almost like a, a honeycomb design. It's used in dresses and um, costumes and things. 
I'll start out with a ball of, of clay. This is about the size of a large gumball. And then I can take that and I can put it in the tool and then I press the tool around it and I pinch the base of the clay. So I'm pinching this, which is kind of forcing the clay to go into the fabric and I'm turning it as I pinch it. So it, it's almost like it's extruding through the fabric. And when I gently pull that fabric away, I end up with this cool textured berry. And there's usually a little stem on there and I can take and pinch off some of that stem. And then I'll position that berry in between my leaves. And then I might decide I wanna do some little red berries in there too. And those are just done rolling a little ball of clay if you want to make like where a little stem would have been on that berry or a little indentation, you can make a little indentation. And I'm going to do, I usually do clusters of three of these. And again, I'm just setting these on here. I'm not attaching them at this point. Um, uh, who's the manufacturer? Is it Raku clay? Something so like I use continental clay. Um, just because they're somewhat local to me. I order the clay in by the skid. And, um, but I, when I go out and do workshops, I use local clay wherever I can, where I'm teaching, if I'm, especially if I'm flying. Um, so, you know, B-Mix, a low fire white, if you're working with just earthenware and you're not doing any stoneware firing or mid-range firing, um, just ask for a smooth white or ask for a raku clay body. The nice thing with a raku clay body with continental anyway is this has a firing range all the way up to cone 10. But if you want this to be vitrified, if I was making a bowl with this that I was going to eat off of, and so with stoneware to make it so that it is um, not gonna absorb moisture, which is vitrified, you vitrify the clay by firing it, um, it would need to go to cone 10 to be vitrified. Um, for decorative pieces like this, it really doesn't matter, especially when you're doing non-fired colors on it. Um, so this has a really wide firing range of 04 up to all the way to cone 10. So if somebody wants to do a stoneware, you could fire this to cone 5, cone 6. Again, it's decorative. It's not being eaten off of. It's not a dinnerware piece. Um, it's fine to do that and use non-fired colors. I could do low fire colors on here. I could do mid range colors on here and I could go all the way up to cone 10 if I wanted on this clay body. All right, let's make it. They oh. have a citronella plant that has awesome leaves, but she hasn't sent it because it would be worse to cut out than the original maple. <laughs> she doesn't want to do that. Oh yeah, I've, I've had a few people send me some leaves and um, they're, they're beautiful leaves, but they some of them are really a pain. I did talk to somebody about making a dye for cutting some of them. And I haven't had a chance to do that yet. And we're going to try that and see. And that might work with some of the more intricate leaves. All right. So doing a, a acorn, I start out with a larger ball of clay. Again, the size of a gumball, depending how big you want your acorns to be. And then I'll use a wooden tool. And I'll kind of go in the middle of that. And I'll take and I'll press that in and then kind of roll it around my ball of clay and I'm making an indentation so it looks like there's an acorn cap on here. So it kind of looks like a little mushroom at this point and I'm just going to take and pinch out this bottom a little bit and smooth that out. And I can bring it if I want to a little bit more, not a point, but more oval shaped than round, leaving that, that cap area. And then I actually take that tool, that fabric, kind of fold that over and I just roll this. And so I'm gonna set it down on the table to do it, but I just basically take this and I roll it into the fabric and it kind of picks up that texture on the top and acorns have kind of a fun texture on their cap and it also kind of rolls the edge 
of that cap down a little bit so that it's not a straight line out and it looks more like it's a cap coming over the top without taking two pieces and making a cap that goes over the top. So you can kind of see that texture in the camera. If I hold it a little further away, sometimes it, it shows up better. And then I'm going to take that tool. I'm going to poke a little hole in the top. I'm trying to turn that to open it up a little bit. I'm going to make just a little stem. If you decide to Raku finish this, would you biscuit to O6? No, because this is made with Raku clay. And so I would actually fire this to 04, which would give me a hotter firing. If I was building this with earthenware clay, I would probably take it to an 06 like I do with cast pieces. My little stem I put into that hole, give it a little twist. You could use slip water in there and I can bend that little top a little bit and I've got my little acorn. And so I'll decide kind of where I want that to set on my piece. Again, not attaching it, just setting them loose on there. Now, if I want to make little pumpkins on this big one, I made little pumpkins in the front here. I can just take and start out if I want a round pumpkin. I'm going to start out with a little ball of clay. And I can take that same tool and kind of roll that going more vertically on this piece to make it like the indentations on a pumpkin. When you get to the last couple, you want to kind of look ahead to make sure you kind of have even spacing in there. That's my little pumpkin. And then again, the top, I can poke a little hole in here, make a little stem wet it, slip, put it into that opening, give it a little twist, and I've got a little pumpkin. And then I'm going to kind of stand this up and tap it a little bit to flatten the bottom. And I can set that wherever I want that. If I want a little bit longer, elongated pumpkin, I'm going to make this one a little bit bigger. I'm going to start out with a ball of clay, and then I'm going to kind of roll it this way to make it a little bit more oval shaped. We'll make this even a little bit thinner and longer. And it's basically the same thing, but if my tool can't rock the whole way, then I may have to kind of press it in and pull it down as I go down on the pumpkin to make my indentations. Got one more I can fit in here. And I'm going to flatten the bottom, put a little indentation in the top, make my little stem. And I've got a little bit taller pumpkin. So we've got two little pumpkins. So I could make, again, I probably would do clusters of three um, on there. And I would do three different sizes. So I've got a couple little pumpkins on that. So I would continue working, making my leaves, making my berries, working all around the hat. And then I'm going to go along and I'm going to, I can smooth the hat. If you've been in a workshop with me, you know that I don't like to put water out on the table because people tend to dip their finger in and, and they're rubbing and they're dipping and rubbing and, and water's running down their piece and then their piece is sitting in a puddle. <laughs> So I usually don't use water at this point. If you do, just be very, very careful that you're not ending up having your piece sitting in a puddle of water. A lot of times at this point, I just use my finger and I go over and I smooth out imperfections. I can always go over it with a damp sponge or a wet sponge after it dries. So I'm not worried about getting this perfectly smooth. Now on my larger one, I tried using, Kemper makes these star cutters. And I, I like these star cutters, but on my big one, because I made it probably three quarters of an inch thick, these star cutters didn't cut through real well because the, the piece was so thick. On this smaller or thinner piece, I should be able to use these star cutters. I also wanted bigger stars 
cut out on this piece. And so this is the largest star cutter, you know, is a, a lot smaller. I can almost put it through this big one. So these I cut out just using a scalpel. And a lot of times when the clay is this wet, it doesn't work the best to cut it out. Sometimes I'll leave it sit until it's a little bit more leather hard before I cut the, the stars out. But I'm gonna um, do one on here. And the reason it works a lot of times when it's leather hard is because the clay is just not as sticky as it is in this really wet stage. And especially if you're working with a smooth clay, you're gonna have a harder time getting that smooth clay. Um, it's not a, a problem of actually cutting it. It's when you go to pop this star out that a lot of times it will kind of stick. And I'm just cutting around one more time to make sure that I've got everything cut out and that it's not sticking. And then I'll usually take the other hand, other end of that handle and I'll kind of push it through. If I can't easily push this through, don't force it because you don't want to bust the piece or indent the clay really bad. I can take my finger and I can smooth this out. Um, or on smaller pieces, thinner pieces, the star cutters work well. And I'm just going to take a piece of clay here and flatten it out and show you the difference between a thin piece of clay and how it will work versus a thick piece of clay. So on a thin piece, I can take this and I can press this in and I'll lift this up and it's, it's coming through onto the other side. So on this hat, I would have my hand on the inside of the piece giving support and then I would be pushing into. So it would be like, this would be my hand on the inside and I would be taking this and I'd be pressing it in. If I just take and push this in, there's a good chance the clay is just going to push in. You kind of need that support behind. That's where leaving that paper in there is helpful because that kind of acts as support behind it. Once you've done that cutout, there's a little plunger on here that you push and it pushes that little clay star out. Um, sometimes we'll take these little pieces of clay, flatten them out, and you can make little dimensional stars that you could take and you could score and slip and add on to the piece. If I try to do that same thing with a piece that's really thick, watch what happens. When I push in, I have to go through so much more clay. It comes through on the other side and I can pull this out, but my star is real rounded because it's gone in all the way up to kind of the smooth edge of the clay or of the tool in the clay. So it gives you not a really nice star shape. It kind of distorts it a little bit when the clay is really thick. So these are great if you're doing small versions of this and you can use these and, and just push the plunger out to get the clay out of that punch. That's the largest one. There are um, five different sizes in the set. You have those little cutters? Yep, we've got these on, on the website. We just got more of them in stock not too long ago. I do owe somebody out there one star. I out. still have not figured out. So if that person is watching, <laughs> you messaged me somewhere. And if it was an email, I cannot find the email. And I don't remember who it was, but they were missing one of these in the set that they got. And we got more in, and I still haven't figured out who that person is. <laughs> Lisa said that she taught her dermatologist today her surgical alcohol marker went kaput and she informed her that she can <laughs> pull out the tip and add alcohol and it was refreshed. <laughs> yes, very so good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So now there's paper still inside this. So when I push that star through, it kind of pushed the paper away. So don't be surprised when you go to push that out, if you get some resistance from the back side that the paper is in there. Once this piece is firm enough, I'm going to take, and I would take all of my leaves off right now. I'm holding this so that they won't flop off. But then I would reach inside and I would just twist like this to get most of that paper out of the inside before I fire it. Take that out. Um, if a little bit of paper sticks in the top, it'll burn away in firing. You might get a little bit of smoke from that. Um, not the, the end of the world. 
Now, if you want to light this up, people have asked, how do you how do you light this then? There's different ways you can do this. There are a lot of those little LED lights that are on like a copper wire. You could just stuff those inside. Some of them are battery operated, some of them plug in. If you um, are used to the traditional style pinch light like this, and you wanna put this type of a light, and you can do colored bulbs or flicker bulbs. I played around today with flicker bulbs. Last year after Christmas, I bought a bunch of different color bulbs on clearance. And I found out that the ones I got are the bigger bulbs that don't fit in this size socket. So if you want to use a pinch style light or the kind that are used with Christmas trees where they have like the, the, the um, threaded piece that goes in there and then you, you screw that on like you do in a tree base. I just made a clay ring like this for holding my light up. And this is very crude, but it works. And so this is just a ring of clay that I took and I poked a hole in the middle and I kind of worked the clay like this. And then I put a little indentation in there where the cord can go under. So it's big enough for my pinch light to come up inside there. I can pinch this end together. It will stick in there. My cord will go out under that indentation. And then this would sit underneath my hat and then it holds the light up in there. You don't want this light falling over on its side in there because some of these bulbs will get hot and you don't want that burning a table or some type of a surface or something that you have that setting on. So that's how um, I do it. You could also just put a string of Christmas tree lights in there, different colors. There's different types of light bulbs that change colors. There's lots of cool LED type lights that are out there now that you can use to light things like this up. All right, any questions on the building process of this? No. All right, so the next thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to fire this piece. And so um, people always ask, how long does this need to dry before it, it gets fired? And it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm usually hesitant with my answer because I have told people in the past, if you let it dry you know, for a week, set it on top of your kiln, you should be good. Well, I've had people come back and say, well, I let it sit out on my patio for months and it blew up when I fired it. Well, what can happen, especially this time of year, a lot of us are dealing with humidity. Um, sometimes some places it's very hot during the day and then it gets very cool and damp in the, in the night. So if this is sitting out somewhere on a patio, in a garage, on a deck, wherever, it will absorb moisture. So it might dry during the day and then when it gets real damp or real humid, that clay will absorb moisture again. So generally what I do is I let pieces dry naturally for a week. If you have areas where there's a lot of air blowing around, <coughs> vents and air conditioning blowing into the room where these pieces are sitting, you might wanna take a plastic garbage bag and loosely lay it over the top to prevent it from drying too fast. If air hits one side of a piece, and that side dries faster than the other side, clay generally shrinks as it dries and you can get some cracking on pieces. You also wanna make sure that this is setting on something that will absorb moisture. I'm working here on foam, but I will take this and I will put this on a piece of drywall or plasterboard, something that will absorb moisture. If you set this on a surface that will not absorb moisture, what's gonna happen? The top of this is gonna dry and the underside, that moisture is going to get trapped underneath here, and you're going to have issues where this piece is going to stick to the surface, the top's going to dry, it's going to shrink, and you're going to get issues with cracking. So don't try to dry it too fast. Let it dry naturally for a week. And then I usually, with all of my clay-built pieces, when I fire them, I do a several-hour soak at the beginning. Most newer kilns, you can program them to do a soak at the beginning of the firing and it basically the kiln heats up to around 180 degrees and it will hold at 180 degrees to dry out any moisture that's left in that piece. Now, how long of a hold do you do? Well, it really depends how big your kiln is, how much stuff you have in there and how damp you think it is. A lot of people say if you take these piece, a piece of clay and you press it against your cheek that you can tell when it feels real cool a lot of times it means that there is um, moisture in the piece yet. And, and there is a lot of truth to that, but not everybody who's new to clay 
can really get that feel. So it's best to do a soak at the beginning of the firing to dry the pieces out. If you're taking it somewhere and having somebody else fire it for you, see if they do a soak on their firing. Um, if they don't, um, see if they can just set it on top of the kiln while it's firing the load before it, um, because that will heat the piece up as well. But if you set this on top of a kiln and you're firing it this week, and then you're not going to put this in the kiln for another week, and this gets exposed to moisture or um, humidity, it can, you know, it'll dry out when it's sitting on the kiln. So if I set it on top of a kiln, that when that kiln is done firing and this is dry enough, I make sure that it goes right in the kiln and starts firing right away. Can you remind um, them if you're going to raku it, what kiln you fire it to? So raku firing, if I do raku fire this one, um, raku firing, I do do a cooler temperature than a lot of other people. Um, I go up to, I, mean, I program what, it. Well, what cone will you biscuit to? So I'll biscuit to 04. So because this is made with raku clay, I will do an 04 firing. If this is low fire clay, a smooth clay, I would do it to an 06, 07. But yeah, an 04. And then when I raku fire it, it's, it's to like 1730 degrees and it holds for 10 minutes. And then it's, it drops to 1680 and then it holds there. And then we pull it out at 1680, put it in a trash can with combustibles. And I just think this like the the band on the hat wiped back with the jade gloss would be really cool i think the hat itself maybe i would do in like a purple glaze um and then the the leaves i would do in like raku glaze i'm not quite sure exactly how i'll do this yet if i if i do raku but i thought i'm going to do it with raku clay and if i decide to do that um i will do that with a, a raku firing now, the way that I finish the one that I've got here, we'll talk about this. This was done, now I'm getting it all dusty with my clay hands. This was all done using the metallic creams. A lot of you have gotten the metallic creams. They come in lots of different colors. Um, I played around with a lot of the colors on this. I used like the dark purple on the hat. So I base coated this piece with all black acrylic color, Mako Softy Black or Duncan's OS Black, one coat of black over everything, and then I dry brushed. And so dry brushing is done with a stiff bristled hog bristle brush. You get a little bit of color in the brush, you wipe most of it out, and you skim across the surface and it catches on the highlights. So the hat was done with the purple, and I took a little bit of the dark blue and I highlighted the edges and it's really hard to get all of that color to show up in the camera. The band on the hat was done with the turquoise color and then I dry brushed a little bit of silver on the highlights. The leaves were all done with a variety of, I use the orange, the yellow, so that goes into the second kit that came out we used the yellow, the orange, the reds, the rust, the brown. I did a little bit of this fern green on some of the leaves. Um, I even took a little bit of the purple, the I think it's amethyst or eggplant that came in that set. I used a little bit of the eggplant on those leaves. The berries were done with the denim blue, which is in the set two. The little berries I did like little black berries. Um, the little red berries were done with the darker red that's in set number two. But the leaves, I just highlighted yellows and oranges and greens and all different colors just dry brushing on there. So you see the black down in the crevices. The idea behind dry brushing is you're just hitting the highlights. Um, the nice thing about those creams is they also work almost like a translucent. And so they're very blendable as you dry brush them they will blend together. Um, they also work as just a paint. So the little berries, those I just painted solid with the red metallic. The buckle was done with the copper, and then it's really hard to see this in the, <laughs> the camera too. I did do the copper foil over the top of that. All the little dots on the hat are done with the foil. And then like I mentioned on the leaves, 
You might be able to see, let me find one that's got, like this one, whoops. This one here has, yeah, it's hard to see that in the camera. There's green on the edges of this leaf. There's copper and there's gold. And I think when I showed this individual leaf, this one I just did the copper. And so when you use the foils, there is an adhesive that you put on, whoops, throwing it here. It's a tacky when dry gel medium. And so you brush that on anywhere that you want the foil. And then the foils come in six inch sheets and you press that foil. So the back side of the foil has like a silver color to it. You press that down once that glue dries, it stays sticky and you press that over those spots of that adhesive and it pulls the foil off of the sheet of plastic. And so there's a kit we have that has all different sets of um, the colors. There's one that has all pastel colors. There's one that has kind of the primaries, the coppers, the golds, the silvers, green, red. Um, there's a couple other colors in that set. Um, and then there's a, a set that has everything in that set. And then um, you seal the piece. And so you can use either a spray sealer. Duncan used to make spray sealers. Um, a lot of people, I know Glazer Ceramics has some, I want to say Plaid has some spray sealers that they carry. And they also carry some of the Aileen's spray sealers. I know some people will buy like the Krylon stuff at um, hardware stores or even Walmart has some of the Krylons and the different sealers. Or Mako has, and Duncan have Mako uh, brush on and uh, gloss and matte sealer that can be used as well. I used, I still have some of the Duncan the satin spray. We still have that on our website. I'm looking down, we still have about 20 cans of the satin spray. I still like the spray sealers. They work a lot easier and faster than, than brushing on, so. Um, Vicki, no, I don't actually do any painting with my hubby. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common misconception that I do any of this stuff. Yeah, no, no. Janine I doesn't really do any of this. She does. She, <laughs> she cooks. She's a very good cook, and she's good at a lot of other things. Yeah, I'm good at a Oh, good. I can joke that that's where she belongs, in the <laughs> kitchen, you know, because she's a woman. I can be really sexist here and and say that. Um, someone wants to know if there is a way to slightly thin the metallics, because they tend to dry too fast where it's so hot there. Yeah, so if you're running into the colors drying, and somebody did message me about that, and I, I played around last night with it, um, water will work to dilute them. But I think what would work better would be like an oil. Um, you know, if you had something like a lavender oil, something like that. Otherwise, um, even I think olive oil would work to thin them. And so the olive oil or the oil, whatever type of oil you use, won't dry out like water will. Um, and I think it will, it will make them very creamy. I wouldn't add it to the whole container necessarily. Um, usually what I do is when I do workshops, I scoop a little bit out with a palette knife put it on a surface and then I would have like a little pile of the oil and if a color is a little bit thicker you can dip into the oil pick up a little bit of the oil mix it into that color do your dry brushing with it um, but I think that's probably your best bet rather than using water I know that the, the colors wash out of brushes with water really easily when I've used them with stencils um, and they've dried onto the stencil I just run them um, under hot water and that takes the color off it, it sometimes will stain the stencil it will stain you know a white hog bristle brush just the pigments in there a lot of times will stain that bristle but it does wash out um, with warm water hot water very easily um, if you decide to use a regular glaze along with a raku glaze what order of firing regular fire cool apply raku and then raku fire good question lisa so um i would actually do it all in one firing because a lot of glazes will fire out to the color that they are in a raku firing and I, I just actually was thinking i just looked over at the the glaze shelf and i saw the jungle gems and i'm like oh my gosh grape divine on here is a purple crystal glaze and i'm like that on the hat would be really cool and i know that that will fire out the way that it looks on the chip chart and i would have a crystal glaze on the hat and then um you know usually you have to be careful of glazes that are are copper bearing glazes. So a lot of times some of your greens, um, and, it, and it would be like in the Mako line, like the element greens, like the uh, emerald green and the leaf, is it leaf green? I'm just trying to look over at the shelf. Um, sapphire green, 
leaf green I think is a, a very popular green. Some of those have copper in them to make those blue green colors. They require copper in the glaze. And so those particular colors might fire out with a metallic look to them. Um, most of the time though, most of products like Stroke and Coat will fire out very true to their color. Crystal glazes I've played around fire out true to their color. Um, I'm looking over the, the foundation glazes. I don't think I've ever had any of those turn out metallic when I fired them, but it, it really would be something to experiment with. But I'm thinking crystal glaze on this hat would be really cool. That purple grape divine would be would be divine on there. Or there's some really cool blues and stuff too. Rhonda wants to know what the price of the mold and paints is. So the molds, um, they come, like I said, there's lots of different sizes. Um, I know this is the the small slender this is the small wide this one is is wider than that one i mean that'll fit inside of it this one i think um i want to say is 34.95 and this might be like 39.95 or 29.95 and 39.95 for these sizes um, several of them are on sale on the website they're also sold in sets you can get like the set of the three slender or the three wide cones the metallic creams vary in price based on how many colors are in the kit. So there was kit number one came out, and I want to say this one might be on sale for like 99. Kit number two has a few less colors. I think that's on sale for like 74.95. There's also a pastel set. Um, I didn't use any of the pastel colors on here. They're really cool colors, but I haven't had a chance yet to play around with those. They're more of a, I think, a springtime or Easter type thing that I'll be um, focusing on. And the foils come in, you can buy them individually, you can buy them in sets. The metallic creams too are sold individually as well. So, and they're uh, eight, 825 or 850 individually and they go a long, long way. I've used some of those metallic creams in about a dozen workshops and I still haven't used a full bottle of any of the colors. Some of them are getting low, but I haven't used a full bottle of those yet. Someone wants to know if you'll come to Panama to teach a class. You get enough people together. Oh, this is okay. <laughs> Panama, Florida. I see oh, what is Lucy. A, okay. Yeah, I was like, I was like Panama. <laughs> I, I don't know where that is for sure. If that's a Panama, is it Panama City or is it just Panama? It's really just called Panama. I I think I see that. I see it's Lucy, okay. and I, I'm pretty sure Lucy is in down Florida. in the Florida <laughs> Panhandle. And and I know we talked about it, and somebody from your facility was going to get in touch with me, and I don't think I've heard from them. So. Um, have them reach out to me again if that's the ones that I'm talking about, if that's who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions in there? No. All right. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Again, all of the, the items that I use tonight are available on our website, learnfiredarts.com. Oh, Panama the Country. You get enough people together, I'll, I'll come there. <laughs> did you, I wonder, did Lucy move? Okay. We'll figure it out. We can talk. Lucy. Might be. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, thanks for joining us uh, tonight, you guys. Um, I'm not sure when we'll be back, but um, I'll try to, to post and have that information out there. Don't forget about uh, Fired Arts Expo is coming up in August. We have several of the teachers' workshops are up there. I've got a few more that will get up hopefully this weekend, and that's coming up in August. And then we've got uh, the Missouri Ceramics Show. Um, that's happening uh, the end of July. Um, where are the dates? They're on here. July 27th, 28th, and 29th. Workshops start on the 27th. The showroom is open 28th and 29th. Um, and then don't forget, too, we've got the coupon code is still good this week for Stroke and Coat. Any Stroke and Coat colors on our website, you can get 10% off. Use the coupon code SC10, and that'll give you 10% off on Stroke and Coat. And on $50 total orders of any products combined, um, we have free shipping in the U.S. 48. Um, sorry, anybody international, um, you don't get free shipping. Um, and actually, we're going to be cutting off shipping fragile items to some international locations starting up. We've had issues with, with items, boxes arriving completely crushed, and trying to file claims on those has been a nightmare because there's multiple post offices involved in it, and they like to point fingers at each other when stuff arrives broken. So we're 
we're going to be cutting off some areas, unfortunately. Canada, you're not one of them. I can say that for sure. But I know Australia is, is one that we just we can't deal with the, the issues that we're having with that. And unfortunately, then customers are waiting um, for, for claims to be decided. And I'm just tired of, of dealing with dealing with those claims and trying to get that straightened out. So sorry about that. But um, all the other stuff, the rubber leaves, anything that's not fragile, um, we will still ship anywhere. So someone did just ask how many you need in a class, but it really depends. So <laughs> so yeah. email me through the website, through our le website, Learn Fired Arts, you can do the contact us. And that honestly is the best way now to reach me because that all is in one place. And it's very easy for me to go back and find those conversations versus messaging me on messenger or texting me on my work phone or t some people have my personal phone and sometimes going back and finding those messages so send me a message and we can talk about it i can look at the the costs what type of projects you want to do it would depend what we would have to ship over for the workshop all of that stuff plays in how many days yep i would be there um usually multiple days makes it much more affordable than flying in for one day obviously to do that so we can figure that out all right well thanks for joining us and we will see you guys uh on our next live take care thanks